Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome to another episode of Celebrating Act 2. Uh, I'm here with my partner, John Coleman. And John, tell us about the special guest we have today. Um, Art, we do have a special guest. Uh, he's a member of our Act 2 generation, if you will. Um, but he's also a very well-known radio personality uh, here in the Los Angeles area. Uh, he is the news anchor on KNX Radio, which, of course, you and I know as the CBS flagship station heard all the way from Santa Monica to San Diego. Now, if you think he's just a newsman or a pretty voice, you're in for a shock. Besides being a respected journalist, he's also a very prolific writer, written more than a dozen books, about 20 screenplays, and had over 1,000 magazine articles published in various uh, publications. Now, he's also created two different newsletters, created and published, and keeps them going. He's both a blogger and a filmmaker, and he's a lifelong sports lover. He's been a sportscaster, a respected sports historian, and, get this, an expert in the business of sports trading cards. Hmm. Somewhere in the long and his spare time, he has even found time to serve on a fundraising committee for a charity for children. Now, if you live in Southern California, you will know his voice, but you may not recognize his face. Until now, thanks to Celebrating Act Two, let's bring on Bob Brill. Hi, guys. Hi, Bob. <laughs> Hi, Bob. Uh, so this you... is what Bob Brill looks like. Yeah, Today. minus a beard, minus hair, you know, everything, you know. So. Right. You did. You shaved the mustache, huh? Yeah, I, I, you know, I had it for like 30 some odd years and my kids at one point had never seen me without the stash. And when I shaved it off, it was like, who are you? you know? <laughs> <laughs> and of course the hair went a long time ago. So that was a long time. I had the same experience. <laughs> and we're, we're still working on this, this part. Okay, but yeah, we're, we, we're, we're close. You but, can but, give but... me some, I'll, t I'll take it. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Bob, uh, uh, we know we know we originally knew you as a, a sportscaster, although you do general news, but that's mm -hmm. what our background. But you've got really this diverse background. Uh, when you uh, ha has it always been that way, or did did certain things kick in uh, after, let's say, the age of fifty? Because I know that one of the most fascinating things that you do to me is that you interview just like really interesting people, and. Hey. Uh, so, so has this always been what you do, uh, like just lots of things, or uh, have, have it, has yeah, it changed? Yeah, it, 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 it always has, actually, since I was a kid. Um, it was like, I, I think it was, I, I couldn't decide really what I ever wanted to do in life, so I decided to do everything. But, <laughs> you know, I, you know um, I, I think, too, uh, when I was in, I guess, the fifth grade, um, our, we were supposed to write a, um, an essay on what we wanted to do when we grew up, so to speak. And uh, I, I wanted to play baseball. That's all I ever wanted to do at that point. I, you know, I wanted to be a major league baseball player, and that was my passion. And I said that, and my teacher said, well, what are you going to do for a backup? And I said, well, what's a backup? And she goes, if you can't play baseball. And I said, oh. So I kind of figured, all right, well, what would keep me close to baseball, right? And I, so I decided I wanted to be a play-by-play -play announcer, and I did do some of that. That kind of led me into radio, and and I've always written, uh, even in high school and junior high, I loved to write, and there were a lot of essays and created. I, I was always a storyteller. I started actually writing and telling jokes when I was like, I guess six, five or six years old, and I would wow. write jokes, and I would give them to family members or perform them for family members, and... and uh, uh, sometimes they were funny, and they always laughed because I was a kid, so they had to, you know. <laughs> and so that kind of gave me this false hope of being a comedian, I guess. But, you know, so, uh, but, you know, and, and uh, I fell in love with journalism probably in one of my early jobs uh, when I they uh, when I was in Palm Springs. I worked for KPSI down there, and I was disc jockey, and which I hated uh, only because it's so boring. And... Um, Unless you could do whatever you want. Nobody lets you do whatever you want, except on the Internet now. But in those days, you couldn't. And um, they made me associate news director, which meant I, I did the afternoon news. And I kind of 
fell into that and I fell in love with it. I, I really did. And I fell in love with news and so on and so forth. And um, in, in next year, uh, well, in, in 2022, I will celebrate my 50th anniversary in radio. So, wow. Uh, yeah. So, it's, uh, and and I still, still remember and by the my way, first time on the air. Pardon? I was just going to say, and still going strong. You've got many years ahead of you. Yeah, right. I, 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 I would like to think so. You know, I, that's my plan. Uh, I want to work uh, for several more years, uh, actually more than several. Uh, you know, I'm kind of in a really neat situation. Um, one of the things I just thought would be kind of cool probably about 35 years ago, I said, wouldn't it be great to, like, have one job and that pays the bills and you could, you know, live with and then be able to do all these other things around it? Uh, like writing and producing and, and uh, just doing other stuff. And uh, it happened. That's where I'm at. That's exactly where I'm at right now. And, uh, you know, at CanX, I, uh, I, I, I work there. That's what pays the bills, you know, and allows me to do the other things that I do. And, uh, you know, because a lot of that certainly doesn't bring a paycheck. <laughs> you know? yeah, I have a question <laughs> for you. Here and there, not much. Bob, so uh, you do a lot of these diverse things. But you're an East Coast kid yeah. that is a transplant, and um, you have a series of Western books, not just one, but the Lancer, uh, what are yeah. the Lancer Heroes? Uh, Lancer Hero of the West, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you have a whole bunch of them. How did uh, uh, the urban East Coast cowboy get into that? My father. Um, uh, my really? father was a big big fan of the westerns and we grew up in the late 50s early 60s watching western you know because if you look at what was on television in the 50s most of what of any genre was westerns and sure. because people love the west and you know that was the glory years of american television and just starting out and you know we we're looking at heroes coming out of the war and out of korea you know we, and western people were heroes to us because we didn't you know we believed what the stories about them that mostly they wrote themselves, you know, and uh, other dime novelists wrote about them. But I fell in love with the Westerns. My father and I would, would watch, you know, um, you know, Have Gun Will Travel and um, uh, the one with Steve McQueen, uh, Wanted Dead or Alive and all these Western shows. And my father told me that he read every Zane Grey Western ever, you wow. know, and growing up. And he was an avid reader from newspapers and whatever. Um, and he was a milkman, so he was just this average guy who wasn't educated or anything, but he loved to read, he loved Westerns. And so that kind of got me into that. And uh, it took me a long time to really decide to write a Western. And this Western series, Lancer Hero of the West, is going to be 10 books. It's six right now. I've done six, and the seventh is planned. Uh, I just haven't had time to write it because I've been doing other stuff. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But um, it's, it's uh, something I love, and... The West, the Lancer series really is like kind of watching those television series from the 50s and 60s, uh, mainly because that, that's how I wrote it. My good friend Jim Christina writes a different type of Western novel, uh, kind of gritty and stuff. But if you like those old TV Westerns, and I, Lancer is based on a compilation of a lot of those TV her heroes, plus my own edition, which he loves Turkish Delight, and he uses it to woo his women. And uh, Turkish Delight is one of those things that it's just if you like good so half gooey treats, uh, Turkish Delight is perfect. And uh, so that's my addition. It's my sweet tooth. So that's kind of my addition to it. Um, but Bob, uh, Bob, how old were you when you uh, started the Lancer series? Uh, first Lancer came out probably mid like 2015. So seven years, I was, um, I just crossed 60. You know? Yeah, so you, you, this was not something you did. No. It might have been a childhood ambition. But right. You didn't get around to it till what most people consider, uh, most Retirement. younger people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, I always said I'd never retire. It's, the retirement is, sounds too boring to me. Um, yeah. But, uh, and that's a type of person, I, I just, I, I love to create. I love to do stuff. I love to work. I love to see a paycheck coming in. Uh, maybe that goes back to my my parents who always said they had to work to pay the bills, you know, and that kind of mentality. Um, but I started Lancer uh, 
one of the reasons I started Lancer so late, I always wanted to write a, a Western series, but the problem with Westerns is more than any other genre, your readers really are in tune to the era. In other words, if one of the things that I have to always watch out for when I'm doing my research is if the episode or the book takes place in 1883 and it takes place on a riverboat, I can't have a riverboat that wasn't built until 1886. So mm -hmm. I've got to do the research. And believe me, Western readers will point that out to you and you'll get these haters that are just crazy, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, like in any other thing. So um, I was really nervous about tackling a Western for that reason. And once I decided to do it, I said, what the heck, I'm doing it. And I, I do my research and, you know, and with the Internet today, um, the type of inter uh, research that I need to do is easy to do. It, it doesn't take me months. It takes me, you know, maybe 20 minutes sometimes to find the answer. So I have a question for you, um, and I really want to move on to uh, uh, some other kinds of things that you do. But sure. because we're with your books, first of all, I want everybody to know that all of your books uh, are available on Amazon. So these are in ancient tomes or one-offs that you've done someplace, but they're yeah. actually real books that right. people can go get on uh, uh, Amazon. But I think uh, what's kind of interesting, and, and you, you wrote a book on baseball, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, I, I think is, is a fine piece that anybody interested in baseball or, or growing up right. as a young kid will really appreciate because uh, it touches on... Uh, uh, something in the youth of all of us, male or female, uh, growing up and having favorite things. But before we get to some other kinds of things you do, you also have another one-off book based on your relationship with, let me be provocative, a stripper. <laughs> uh, so how does a nice newsman like you get involved with a stripper? And is, do you have a guide on how to, to, to woo over a stripper uh, as a subject matter? Well, I, I, it actually started on my sixth birthday. Six years old. Yeah, I was <laughs> pre-raging pre hormones, okay? Um, <laughs> my, 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 it was on my sixth birthday, and basically my mother told me that my birthday was tomorrow. And that was the, uh, the idea was to get me out of the house because they were throwing me a surprise party today, which was my ah, birthday. Nice. And it was a Saturday. And um, my sister was going to set up the surprise party, get the kids in in the basement. And this is in Pittsburgh, okay? I, I was born and partially raised in Pittsburgh, and that's my hometown. I love the Steelers, Penguins, Pirates. I'm a diehard fan, all that. Um, anyway, so my mom took me to Mount Oliver, which was our shopping area from where we lived. And she said, you can pick out whatever you want, you know. And I decided that my brother had baseball cards. My cousins had baseball cards. I didn't have any yet. And I wanted some baseball cards. So uh, Topps Rack Pack, which was three packs in a, in a rack, all of 15 cents at the time. So my mother, I bought two. So my mother spent 30 cents on, I could have whatever I wanted for my birthday. <laughs> and um, got home, had a surprise party, uh, everything. And that night I started opening the cards. And um, on the back of one of the, on the 1959 Topps cards had a cartoon on the back. And the cartoon was usually about the player. And on the back of Don Rudolph's card was a cartoon of uh, a woman dancing on a table, kicking up her leg, a ball player leaning in and looking up her skirt. And it said Don's wife is a professional dancer. And his wife was actually one of the highest paid strippers in the country at the time. And her, her stage name was Patty Wagon. And um, the, pic the cartoon is her. If you look at the cartoon, you, it is her. I mean, it's, there's no doubt about that. And there's some other things about that cartoon which I don't have time to go into, but um, I interviewed the, the guy who's the head of Tops for years when it came to selecting this stuff. And <clears throat> he said he knew Don. Don was kind of an innocuous player at the time, hadn't really done anything. So they thought it was cute that they put his wife on. And um, even at that time, I knew there was something special, you know. And years later, when I was UPI, with UPI, I tried to track them down. Years later after that, I learned that they lived at, like within 10 minutes of me where I grew up in San Fernando in the Los Angeles area. They banked at the bank across the street from where I lived. They, wow. you know, I mean, it was just amazing all the stuff that happened. Uh, and Don coached in Cedar Little League 
the year before I went to that league playing youth baseball. Uh, and he died. He was killed in a car accident, or a truck accident the next year. Um, but and, and Patty continued to live on. I decided I really wanted to write an article about this experience. Uh, I ended up uh, going, finding the daughter who still lived in their house uh, and was getting ready to sell it. And um, I ended up acquiring some memorabilia myself from them. And uh, it was it just became this. I, I just thought this magnificent story that I was handed when I was six years old. And I just thought, you know, this is this is just a great story. So I wanted to do a book and I wanted to do a book because I wanted to have something to base a movie script on. And wow. um, all the research I did writing a, um, a regular book, not a coffee table biography, which is what I call it, <clears throat> um, was going to be take too much time and too much research. And believe me, I have thousands and thousands of documents. I have thousands of photographs. I have all kinds of from you know uh, newspaper clippings you know i have a picture of her and don both taking pictures of president kennedy in 19, the last time he threw out the first ball in washington in 1963 cuz don was the starting pitcher that day and i have a newspaper article from the following day talking about them taking pictures of the president so there's all kinds of stuff so i wrote the script we've been shopping the script for years i haven't found a taker yet um, the book has been out since 2009 um, didn't do very well, but that's okay. It was a, uh, an expensive book in a niche market, you know, so, but we do that. So going in, but we have one that we can base it on. So that, that's in a nutshell, long story short, a short story long, whichever well, you prefer. You know, it is, story. it is a fascinating story, a, a ball player and a stripper. Um, I read some of your stuff on it and, um, apparently they both supported each other's careers. He got a they lot did. of a uh, lot of jokes about being married to a stripper. Yeah. Um, and she got a lot of uh, agita, I guess, about being married to a, yes. a ball player. He used to but, he, he used to stand off stage, and when she would uh, throw her clothes off stage, he would catch them. <laughs> and he actually <laughs> sewed a lot of her costumes. Wow. Yeah. Now that's a strange marriage, but <laughs> they were happy people, and you. You know, what fascinates me is that you discovered this as a kid and finally as an adult came to the point of your own goal, making a screenplay out of it, but writing a book. It's a fascinating story. It all came out of baseball, didn't it? Right. Which, you, which is really yes. your first love. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. There's uh, next to my wife, Paula, baseball is, you know, right there. <laughs> well, Don, we'll make sure that we don't cut that part. <laughs> <laughs> so so let me now move out out of the book uh, uh thing because you do something which actually when uh we were first working on uh, uh, an interview with you uh and we the baseball stuff was there but you have this you're a baseball guy even though you deliver the news you don't make the news so you're not necessarily a newsmaker you didn't go out interviewing uh, well you have interviewed presidents and other people Primarily, uh, your love of news is reporting it to people. Right. But I guess perhaps maybe that's a lead into it. How did you get into uh, this interesting people interview, which to me is fascinating? But uh, how, how did you find these people? And well, what caused you to, to do that, to I start that of, up? I kind of looked at it. I always thought to myself, you know, everybody is an interesting story. If you're on this earth, you have an interesting story. There's something tiny that maybe is, can, is is actually bigger than, because we all, I think in most cases, we kind of underestimate ourselves. And we say, ah, you know, that just happened to me. But, you know, and maybe it's because I've had a lot of things happen to me, you know, over the years that, that I, I think this way. I don't know. But I always thought that everybody has an interesting story to tell. And it may only be one facet of their life. Um, and so I decided I wanted to do these interviews, uh, interesting people with Bob Brill, um, about people's jobs. You know, I think part of it goes back to, um, uh, I can't think of his last name now, Mike, somebody who did the Dirty Jobs show where he would, oh, yeah. you know, go out and do these. Mike all, Rowe. Yeah, Mike Rowe. Yeah, and all, all these ridiculous, you know, dirty jobs that it's like, <laughs> I'm not going to do that, you know. Yeah. I never think of doing that. Um, I get squeamish around worms. I'm not going to do that. Um 
So I, I always thought that there was everybody had an interesting story to tell, even if they didn't think they did. And because I think I look at every story as a movie. Everybody's life is a movie. You know, maybe it's because I think when we go to heaven, uh, God's going to sit there with a movie reel and say, OK, here's your life. You want the condensed form? You want the real version? We're going to give it to you in two minutes before I let you into heaven or send you to hell. You know, one of those <laughs> two. And uh, so, um, but anyway, uh, so that, that's kind of where that came from. And I decided uh, I had, you know, uh, interviewing authors was not what I wanted to do because that's just too easy. And I never liked the um, the, the authors who have a, a new genre of way to make money and that kind of stuff. Never. And um, so what I decided to do was just, interview average people who do average jobs and one of those popular of those shows was the one i did with my auto mechanic i found a really good auto mechanic and i said let's sit down for an hour and talk about all the questions that people have when they hear a thump in their car or when they hear uh when the light comes on in their car that that says engine or whatever and we talked we got into just talking about you know just average stuff because you know, especially today, because your car is mostly a computer, you know, you don't go out and set the points anymore. You don't go out and, you know, you may change the oil and that kind of stuff, but all the other stuff's computerized. And all and mechanics now have to do all that stuff. They're constantly going back to school, you know, for classes and stuff. And the guy I found was just really great. He's since become a friend. He's become my auto mechanic. I talk to him all the time. And uh, But he was just one of the people that we interviewed and... Uh, but it's a wide variety, and it's just mainly because I really feel that everybody has a story that's interesting to tell, whether they think they do or not. Mm. Great concept and, and some fascinating interviews. Thank Where you. Where can we see them? Uh, they're online. They go to, uh, they're done as a podcast. And um, it was before we started it before we did uh, the video cast. We do a video cast with the, the podcast as well that I do for fantasy football with Eric Kramer. But uh, there, uh, Google. If you actually, if you Google my name, um, uh, I come up like 17 of the first 20. Go and it's all variety of stuff, and you'll find it there. Or you can just type in "interesting people with Bob Brill" and it'll come up. Well, you mentioned Kramer. Let's go back to baseball. Okay. Because I, I, what fascinates me is not only do you love the game, you wanted to be as a pro, and mm -hmm. but you got into baseball trading cards, which makes sense after. <laughs> that six-year-old experience yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you've become an expert in trading cards yeah and wrote a newsletter on it i did and you're I... still sought after as a an expert yeah occasionally people uh you know because uh i started the uh the newsletter which was the brill report and i sort of designed it like the kiplinger letter you know for business and i was the first one to actually do we have a, a multiple publications in the industry but they were all took advertising and they all were beholden to the manufacturers. It was all rah-rah hobby stuff. And I was the first one to do uh, a publication that was hard news. I took, uh, it was a subscription service. I charged 40 bucks a month. Uh, you got the newsletter twice a week. Uh, and if you bought, paid in advance for a year, I gave you a 13th month free. And um, basically it was a two page newsletter that I faxed. It was a fax newsletter. And uh, we had, I forget how many subscribers when I sold it, but I, 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 each time I had the stock report, because there were many companies in the industry that were public, I would put that in. I would break news stories. I broke some stories the yeah, New York Times picked up. Uh, we did some feature stories, and it was, we did new product coming out and blurbs. And I got as much into two pages as I could each week, uh, twice a week. And, and it became a must-read. Uh, every manufacturer had it. Uh, many of them had multiple billing points because people, other people in the company wanted their own. You know, um, some companies would, you know, make a copy of it and pass it around to everybody in their company. Uh, so we knew we had more readers than actual uh, subscribers. But at the same time, we had, um, like, the sales division wanted their own delivery. Uh, the uh, marketing division wanted their own copy. So we had multiple, uh, like when FLIR was around, I think I had five billing points at FLIR. Wow. And which was great, you know, uh, because it, it, again, it was a niche, niche uh, industry. And when you think about it, there's, uh, we had uh, people who wanted it for marketing, people who wanted it for trading cards, for products, new um, printing. Uh, two of the biggest printing companies in North America 
Quebecor at the time and um, uh, Proset Press, uh, which had changed names to something else um, down in Dallas. So the two biggest printing companies in North America subscribed. So this was a multifaceted uh, program. And a friend of mine gave me the idea, and um, he never paid for it. He got it for free, but, <laughs> even though I tried. <laughs> but um, the, uh, uh, it, it was, I was the first one to come from a news perspective into this industry um, because the industry really is probably, to be honest with you, one of the dirtiest industries I've ever been involved in. I wow. mean, um, you know, I, I, I was threatened with my life more than once uh, for stories. Okay, I wrote. Yeah, no, and I was followed. Uh, I had to have um, my oldest son, who at the time was a pretty big kid, uh, had to watch my back as I walked through a card show um, because I, I literally did have my life threatened over stories that I wrote, broke. And uh, man, some manufacturers hated my guts uh, because I broke stories that put them in a bad light. You know, when they were counterfeiting cards as manufacturers and I broke that story, or when um, the head of uh, NFL properties and their chief lawyer, um, got fired because they ha were doing some really, really illegal things uh, and feeding their bosses this line of bull uh, and getting million dollar kickbacks. I was covering that story and I broke that story. Yeah. And uh, so I had to watch my back from a couple of uh, former Harvard lawyers who were looking that anything that I said to try to uh, throw a lawsuit at me. Wow. Me you up, know, so. Bob, most of us relate to, uh, a baseball, I call them baseball cards, but trading cards, mm -hmm. whether it's football, baseball, soccer, whatever the sport. Um, you know, as a kid, I'd buy the cards so we could flip them or trade them and right. uh, and the gum. So did I. <laughs> and and people, most people still don't realize that because they are collectibles, mm -hmm. it's a million dollar, multi million dollar industry. Oh, yeah. yeah. And ripe for, think about this. You're, you've got the ability to print. Another Honus Wagner card, if you will, right? The the one card there's only six ever printed, something like that. Yeah. You you could print as many as you want and sell them here and sell them there. The 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 industry was ripe for corruption. Yes. Nobody ever thought about that. And Nobody ever thought about that until you came along and started approaching it as a newsman. Right. Well, and the one thing I'm going to suggest is that um, Marie Callender and the rest of them better hope that you never start becoming an expert on apple pie yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> because you you you, you single-handedly uh, and it's a good thing that the uh, chicago uh, white Sox, you weren't around then because oh they did get into trouble anyway <laughs> i really about that by the way <laughs> i it, it's funny you should mention that because um, one of the scripts i love uh, that i haven't really had but success with is called uh, 1920 the following season because a lot of people don't realize uh, in 1919, the White Sox were banned. They never played again. Actually, they played the 1920 season. They had A lot of them had better years than in 1919. Most of them got a raise based on the 1919 season. And it wasn't until actually 19, uh, the last six games of the year in 1920 that they were, uh, they were no longer playing. And then, they, uh, then the trial took place in the next year. And then they eventually were banned from baseball. But um, and I wrote a story about the 20, 1920 season and the fascinating year that because 1920, as it turns out, is one of the most important years in American history. It was the year women got the right to vote. Uh, it w and there was all kinds of uh, prohibition was in, in uh, going on. And it was the year the, the last year of the Black Sox actually playing. So um, and there's so many other things that took place in um, 1920 that uh, that I cover in the script. It's just fascinating, and it, it, if you ever get a chance, just re go back and look at the calendar for 1920, and it's amazing. But uh, getting back to the baseball cards, you know, uh, mentioning the fact that there are, there are cards today selling over a million dollars, and sure. those cards just printed in the last 10 years. You know, yeah. uh, the manufacturers have glommed on to something, um, limited editions that are really limited but they make multiple versions of the limited edition. So they're selling <laughs> directly to the public. Um, oh, golly. There, you know, there's so many things that the manufacturers have taken, which, I mean, to me, uh, as an out, uh, looking at it from the outside, are just criminal, you know, that, that, that they're doing this. And, they're, they're, you know, they're selling boxes of cards, which include 10 cards for $3,200. Yeah. 
yeah. to the public. You know, thirty that's three hundred and twenty dollars a card, and you don't even know what they are. You don't have no idea what, what they are. You may get ten stiffs, okay? You know you're gonna get an autograph, you know you're gonna get a patch card, you're gonna get a jersey card, whatever, but you don't know who. You can right. get like ten nobodies and you just spent thirty two hundred dollars, yeah. you know, of your hard earned money. So it's become a rich man's game or a speculator's game. It, it's it's really like the stock market. It's it's not for kids anymore, I guess. No. Huh? No, matter of fact, I had you know I had my store for thirteen years, and we had we used to promote kids' nights and all kinds of stuff. And it doesn't really happen much anymore. It happens a little bit, um, but the kids have been priced out of the hobby because even then, you know, we'd have packs at a dollar ninety nine for kids, and we'd have the the adult packs which are twenty bucks or eighteen dollars. And the kids didn't want the the dollar ninety nine packs. They they would come in and they'd want the twenty dollar packs. And we we had some serious theft in our store. At one point, uh, I I probably when I had my store over 13 years, I probably s sent more kids home in a police car, you know, than I ever thought. <laughs> I and the good thing is, one of those kids came back years later, and he was working as a, uh, at a as a used car salesman, and he came in one day, and I literally sent him home in a police car. Uh, his mom was in the front yard talking to a neighbor when a police car pulls up with her kid in the back, and she was devastated, and because this kid was stealing from me, and I caught him. And um, he came back probably about four or five years later. And he said, uh, Mr. Brill? And I said, yeah. And he says, I want to thank you. I said, well, I says, when you sent me home in that police car, it's probably the best thing that ever happened in my life. I turned my life around. Um, I realized that there were other things in life that I kind of needed to do. And, and I kind of grew up in a hurry. And now I've got a really good job. I'm selling cars at uh, the car dealership down there. And uh, he came in at a with a tie and everything. And it was like, wow, you know, it was one of those things you realize you did the right thing and it came back and you changed somebody's life, which was, you know, I mean, anytime you can do that in life, it's, it's always, you know, better than anything else you can do. Right. So the books, uh, the baseball cards, the bit, the store with the mm -hmm. baseball cards, the blogs, uh, screenplays, mm -hmm. all of this while you're still in radio all these years. Yeah. Yeah, um, it, it's I, I'm working probably a little bit more now just this time of year, uh, just because I do a lot more fill in um, at this time of the year. So it's a little sometimes it'd be a little difficult, uh, you know, just to find time to do anything. And I've got um, because I, I'm, I'm brokering a collection for uh, a guy right now as well, which means basically he's got this huge collection and I'm liquidating it for him and finding out and, uh, you know, just finding time to do stuff at uh, it's become a little bit more difficult as I got older because I've, I've taken on, I've prob probably taken on a little bit more than I should, but, you know, I'm, I get committed to do something and I, I see it through, you know. Well, and, uh, so. I think we should take advantage of the fact that, uh, first, of, uh, to thank you for uh, finding the time to sit down and speak with us. But quite <laughs> frankly, since you seem to be enjoying it so much, even perhaps more than we are or our audience, <laughs> Uh, we're going to have you back. Uh, well, thank because you. Because I'm, sure I'm sure that we've missed about 30 other very interesting things <laughs> yeah. you've been involved in, some of them recently and some of them in years past. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, you, I love your, Bob, I love your attitude that you're never going to retire. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, well, welcome, uh, to, welcome to our world. Yeah, well, yeah. We, we just bought a condo, so I'm kind of, uh, I, I thought, well, now I have to work, right? And I thought, wait a second, I was running before. I still had to work. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, you know, John, I, I just look at it, and I'll, last thing I'll say before, before we have, I know you guys have to go, is that um, I just enjoy working. I enjoy creating. And, you know, even if there's not a paycheck uh, attached to it, it's better if there is a paycheck attached to it. But even if there's not, you know, I just enjoy working and creating. And, um, I think uh, one person told me, said, you have a day and you try to figure out how much time you have free so that you can put stuff in there. And um, I guess that's probably, I, but I, I don't consider myself a workaholic. I don't um, because I can walk away and I just, I just enjoy working and that's, you know, and creating. Yeah. What's the old saying? If, if you, uh, Find something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Bob, thank you so much. This is wonderful. 
Uh, and I guess the, the, the old uh, cliche sign off here is we'll see you on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good to me. You know, as long, long as you can hear me, that's that's the greatest thing that, that there is. Thanks, guys. I really enjoyed this. and I, I appreciate it. And anytime you want me back, I'll be back. So a lot of fun. And don't don't retire, for God's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> for more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our Web page. Follow us on Facebook. Subscribe to us on YouTube. And tell your friends, Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.